As we follow 
Take your Bibles and open to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 17 this morning. The book of Acts, Acts chapter 17. Now you wonder why we're in Acts, because I've been in it for a while. <laughs> and finding some wonderful and great things in here. Not only teaching, but preaching material for us, challenges for us, encouragements for us. And that's what we're going to look at today. Uh, since we've been looking at the first message that was ever preached at Pentecost, uh, the, at the birth of the church in the New Testament by the first apostle Peter himself, we move along in it and we get over here to chapter 17 and we find the apostle Paul is sharing the gospel and then they are accused of men that turned their world upside down for Jesus Christ. What are we doing today to turn our world upside down? You know what it was? It was the message. You see, if you got the right message, we can turn our world upside down. And the reason why we're not turning it upside down today, because I don't believe we've got the message being preached like it ought to be. We've got messages all right going out, but it's all positive thinking and get rich and get quick and name it and get claim it and bake it. And you can have it and you can prosper and be prosperity and fame and fortune and all of that kind of stuff. Folks, that's not what's going to turn our world upside down for Jesus Christ. That's what's going to do nothing but lead us more into the worldly and carnal and flesh than it is unto the Lord. And so what was it? That, what was this message that these men preached that literally revolutionized the lives of people in their world and turned them right side up or upside down, whichever way you want to do it? Amen? And but they see, but first of all, 
if we're going to have a message, there has to be a messenger. If we're going to have to ha- a message, we're going to have to have a messenger. Amen? If we're going to have a message, we're going to have to have a messenger. And what kind of messenger do we want to be? What kind of messenger do, does God require of us? And we have a wonderful example here in Acts chapter 17 uh, of the Apostle Paul and his life and the kind of messenger he was. Then we're going to look at his message. Then we're going to look at the results of his message. Then we're going to look at the reaction of the message, you see, as we go through it. But first of all, look what Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? How shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? That's you. It's not just me and Pastor Woodward here. We're all preachers of the gospel. We're all to share their faith. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. You see. And so you want beautiful feet? Go share the gospel. Amen? Isn't that what it says? How many of you like to have beautiful feet? I've seen some of yours out here on Thursday. And I've seen flip-flops and, oh, I've seen all kinds of feet. Amen. But God can give us beautiful feet if we're willing to take the gospel of peace, of glad tidings, of good news. But we've got to take the right message. See, we've got a lot of preachers out here today that are giving us all kinds of messages And and the problem is, you see, people are responding, but they're not responding to the right message. Because, you see, whatever you believe is what you become and what you do. So you got to hear the right message. But in order to hear the right message, we've got to have a messenger. you got Matthew 28. It says, go into all the nations and teach them and baptize them in the name of the Father and teach them whatsoever things I've commanded you. And, lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the earth. Mark 16, 15. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You see, that's our mandate. That's our command. That's our commission from the Lord. And that's for every born-again believer that's saved and born again is to each one of us reach one and to share our faith. We are the preachers, and we need to have the right message. But what kind of messenger ought we to be? And I think this will be a good challenge to all of us. I think it will be a challenge to those preachers and missionaries and evangelists that may be watching and listening and hearing. Let's take a look at the Apostle Paul now here in Acts chapter 17, if you would please, beginning in verse number 1. But before we read it, notice where he's at. He's in Thessalonica. Now that was interesting as we studied a little bit on Thessalonica and looked at it and found out about it a little bit there. It's by the Adriatic Sea. And it's a seaport. It's got a beautiful harbor. It was a thriving city. It was a big city. It was a metropolitan area there in Thessalonica. And, and Thessalonica was one of the few, very few uh, cities that wasn't under Rome uh, uh, control. That somehow either the leaders of Thessalonica had made an agreement with Caesar and with Rome there, and they did not come under their jurisdiction or their control. And Rome literally gave them freedom to govern themselves and to govern. So we have this wonderful city. Paul's second missionary journey, he comes back to to meet this man, Jason, who is a believer in the Lord, a strong believer, and he comes with a messenger, and he comes with a message. Now when they had passed through there, and they uh, uh, came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, now watch this, as his manner was, that's important, he went unto them And three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. That three Sabbath days is three weeks, 21 days. And as Paul Manor was, whenever he showed up in town, the first place he went was to the synagogue. Why? Because the gospel is to be preached to the Jew first and then the Gentile, the Greek. And there, and most of the time, Paul would go to those first who had somewhat of an idea of the Scriptures, who had an understanding of the Scriptures, and he would debate and talk with them over the Scriptures. And this is exactly what he was doing. And and we see some wonderful things about this man. Let's notice something about this particular messenger. 
Notice here it says he was a man who kept on for the Lord. If we're going to be messengers today for the Lord Jesus Christ, we've got to be men and women that are going to keep on for the Lord. So many quit today, get out of the battle, get out of the race, give up, wash out. Oh, they get their feelings hurt. They get chips on their shoulder. Pastors get discouraged. They quit. They give up. No, no. If we're going to be messengers of the Lord Jesus Christ, folks, we got to keep on in spite of the opposition, in spite of persecution, in spite of ridicule, in spite of people talking about us or coming after us. We just simply got to just keep on keeping on. And Paul Paul was a man of a messenger, the type of messenger, was a guy that he was determined, I'm going to run my race, I'm going to finish the course, I'm going to keep the faith, and henceforth there's a tremendous reward awaiting for me when I get to glory. Now we need to quit getting so offended and quit getting so discouraged and, and, and getting dropping out uh, simply because of all of these things. A messenger, if we're going to be a messenger of Christ, let's follow Paul's example. Let's Keep on keeping on for the Lord until Jesus comes in the clouds of glory. You see, don't give up. Don't quit. Don't get discouraged. You keep on keeping on. And I say that to you preachers and pastors and evangelists. I know uh, we've all been there. And Dr. Woodward, we've been there and together. We know what, what it's like. And we know the criticism. We know the, 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 the condemning. And we know the judging. And we know the, the coming and the persecution. And we get discouraged. And, but you just got to keep on. We've got a message from the Lord, and we're all messengers of Christ, and we just got to keep running the race until Jesus comes in the clouds of glory, because we've got people that need to get saved, and the only way Paul says they're going to get saved is by preachers that are being sent with beautiful feet with the right message. So first of all, we notice Paul was a man that kept on for the Lord. Notice secondly about this man. He was a man who sowed the gospel everywhere. He sowed the gospel seed everywhere Paul went. Let me ask you, how are you doing with sowing the seed? Are we sowing the seed everywhere we go? Are we sharing Christ with those at work? Are we sharing Christ with those on the playground, the schoolhouse? Are we sharing Christ with our neighbors and in our neighborhood and people we live right next door to? I mean, simply, you know, I mean, are we, are we sharing and sowing the seed? Everywhere we go. Remember, we're messengers. We've got a message, and we have the right message, church. Okay? And we need to be sowing that seed everywhere we go. And Paul was that kind of messenger. You see, if we've got a message, if we're going to hear the message, and people are going to respond to it, there's got to be a messenger, and this is the kind of messenger we need to be. We need to be one that's not going to quit, that's going to keep going, and we need to be one that's going to be sowing the seed everywhere we go, sharing our faith, giving a witness, giving a testimony. Notice, he sowed the seed. Paul didn't win every person to Christ he came in contact with, and neither will you and I, but you can at least sow the seed. Then let the Spirit of God begin to work on it, send another soul winner by, send somebody else by, begin to water it, and the next thing you know, it's going to germinate, take root and take ground, and spring up and bear fruit. Messenger. Notice what other kind of messenger was. He was a messenger who had followed a plan. He had a plan. What was that plan? Notice what it says. As his manner was, he went into the synagogue. See, he had a plan. Soul winning's a plan. You need to have a plan. Don't just go hit and miss. Put something together. Plan it together. Uh, and, and lay it out. And follow your plan that you're going to share that message with someone today or tomorrow. Call them up. Set up an appointment and, and be with them uh, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't let a day go by. I met a man yesterday morning, and I said, I'll call you later this afternoon. And I called him later this afternoon, and I went out to his house last evening. I asked the wife here, what time is a chicken going to be ready? And uh, about an hour, I said, good, that's just all the time I need. And I took off and went over, saw this man, and I took him several of our tracks and our, 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 our church and announcements and our cards. And I said, I remember this morning I introduced myself to you as the pastor of the church. I just want to let you know that's exactly what I am. Here's my stuff. Here's my credentials. And this is all about our church and our ministry. And we'd really like to, uh, to, to share the gospel with you and come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Christ. I want to invite you to come to church tomorrow and come on out and share with us. If not, watch us on television. Get on the TV. Get on the radio. Get on the computer if you know how to use one. And everything is there to tell you what to do. And guess what? Then that man hopefully, see, the seed was planted. Now I've got to let the Holy Spirit do the rest. You see? It's what you got to do. You just got to do it. So what do we need to be? We need to be men and women that are going to what? First of all, we're going to do what? Keep on keeping on. We're going to be men and women that what? That sow the what? What are we going to sow? What is the seed? Huh? The gospel. The scripture. The word of God. There's a lot of sowing going on today, folks. And it's not sowing prosperity. It's not sowing health and wealth and get rich and famous and, and powerful and position and money and all of this stuff. I challenged our people last week to go out on the internet and check out the top paid preachers in America today. And one of our ladies came in and she said, I did it, I did it. And immediately she said, you wouldn't believe who it was. And she named his name. And I said, yeah, I know. His annual worth is $760 million. That's why Jesus said it would be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the gates of heaven. And you see, there's a lot of rich preachers out there that everything geared around prosperity and money and gain and getting and having and not the gospel. I see the people watch this and I'm not listening to that guy. That's all right. Just trying to tell you the truth. I'm not in this for the gospel. Another one was worth 400, 450 million. This is their annual income. Own mansions of millions of dollars of mansions. They own islands. They own Lear jets. They own uh, Corsairs. They own Gulf Streams. I mean, not one, sometimes two and three. One preacher owns eight Roll Royces. One's not good enough. You've got to have eight. Jesus had to walk everywhere he went. Didn't even have a place to sleep. Didn't own a pillow. Only had one set of clothes that never wore out. Well, let's look at the second thing. Now, we've got a messenger, right? Now, if we're going to be messengers, we've got to have the right message. Let's look at the message. It's real simple. Now, this is tough. I hope you can get a hold of this. This message is really, really tough. Are you ready? Verse 3. Now notice what he was doing in verse 2. He was what? He was reasoning with them out the scriptures. In other words, the message, you see, the message, there has to be a source and authority. What is our source and authority of the message? It is the scriptures. It's not all what you're hearing today. You see, our source and authority, folks, is not from a dynasty. Come on, talk to me. Our source this morning and authority is not from a denomination. It's not from a headquarters. It's not from a group of men or a panel of men, you see, or different. No, our source and authority this morning is the Scriptures, the Word of Almighty God. That's where we get our message. We don't get it from all of those other things, from faiths, denominations, uh, from uh, dynasties, from high headquarters, whatever. No, our authority and our source of our message comes from the Scriptures. This is our source. That's why we've got the right message. See, if the source isn't and the authority isn't coming from the scriptures, then you got the wrong message. So, first of all, what was our what was our messenger doing? He was sitting in the synagogue with devout Jews. And if you study a little bit more, there were also God-fearing Greeks were there with them, Gentiles, and he was discussing the scriptures with them. You see, because that's where Paul's source and authority came from. So now that he got that established and settled, he goes, all right, here it is, fellas. Here is the message. I'm the messenger that God has sent to you this week, and here's the message. Get it? Don't miss it. Get it. Here it is. Opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered, risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. 
Paul says, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Paul says, we come preaching Christ and him crucified, buried, risen, and coming again. That's our message, church, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Tough message, wasn't it? One verse. He says, here it is, fellas, after three weeks of debating the scriptures and the authority and the source of the scripture, here it is, Thessalonica, you devout Jews, you rabbis, you scribes, you Pharisees, you God-fearing Greeks that are with us today, here is the message that Christ suffered. He went to Calvary and the cross and he died there and shed his blood for your sin and for my sin that you and I might have eternal life, everlasting life, and he paid the ultimate sacrifice as God slain his son on the cross that day but it didn't stop there fellas I'm telling you he was buried and then he rose again on the third day victory and triumphant over the grave and this person that I'm preaching to you is none other than Jesus Christ and when he said Jesus Christ he said he is Jesus the Messiah that's our message if we would preach more of this and get this message out we'd see people get saved Pastor mentioned some things this morning about uh, here we've gotten used to everything and he was going and naming a bunch of different sins that the church has become complacent with and tolerated with and doesn't speak out much anymore on. And this is one of them right here. The church has become complacent on salvation and the message of the gospel and we want to preach everything else but that. And we wonder why we're not turning our world upside down. Wondering why there's not a revolutionary going on in the lives of people. Because we're not getting the right message out. Because we're taking it from wrong authority and wrong sources. So there's the message. Real tough, wasn't it? And therefore, fellas, the very message that you believe determines who you are and what you will do. And that's why we have what we have today because everybody's believing a different message out there and they're becoming, they're becoming what they believe and they're doing what it is. And what is that? Get rich. Get wealthy. Have it all. Name it and claim it. It's yours. Prosperity gospel. That's not the Bible. I didn't say that God wouldn't bless you financially. He will. The Bible says it's God that giveth thee the power to gain wealth. And if God wants you to have wealth, he'll give it to you. But I guarantee it'll be for a purpose and a reason. That's because he can trust you with it. And he can say, man, I've got a channel over here. I know this person's heart and their, and their desire. And I know this woman, this man, this couple, they have such a desire to see people saved and the gospel and the message of the gospel and my work. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to bless them because I can trust them with it. And they're going to become like a big funnel. And God's going to channel it in. And on the other end of the funnel, there's a whole big, this big, as it's pouring out, as fast as it's coming out into the world of God into reaching of souls not so that we can gain it and hoard it not so that we can live in million dollar homes drive million dollar cars own 40 million dollar jets we're going to become and do what we believe and what we believe is the message we receive and if we're not receiving the right message we're in trouble now look at this Look at the next thing. So we got the messenger. Who was the messenger? Paul. What kind of a messenger was he? He was a man that, number one, kept on going for the Lord. Didn't quit. Number two, he sowed the seed. What's the seed? Gospel message. Number three, what was it? He had a plan. He followed a plan. Then he said, here's the message. What's the message? How that Christ suffered and died how he was buried and rose again, and how who I've preached unto you today is none other than Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something. When we preach that kind of message, watch what happens. Look at the next verse. Are you ready with me? Verse 14. And some of them believed. Say that with me. And some of them believed. And consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a multitude, and what? Women, not a few. He lists the three groups that were saved. First of all, he said to you Jews, some of you Jews and your children and your families got saved. Here's the results of it. The Jews were saved. Here's the second. Many God-fearing Greeks were saved. 
And here's the third. There were many important women in Thessalonica. They had roles, they had positions, they had influence. And yet the gospel saved these men and women. And that's why, uh, later on, that's why it turned the world upside down because of this massive city of the seaport that was free from Roman rule, but yet they were still under Roman Caesar. Matter of fact, the great highway that Rome built from the Adriatic Sea all the way to the Middle East, that's over towards Baghdad, okay, was built by Rome. And it was the main traveled highway. And that main street went right down Main Street, Thessalonica. And these believers begin to share the gospel with all types of languages, nationalities that came through there through that trade port and everything and evangelized the world. And these leaders said, something's going wrong. These guys are turning our world upside down for Jesus Christ. Boy, would to God we get accused of that. Boy, if they want to blame this church for anything of that, let them blame this church for that that we're guilty of turning lives around and changing their lives and turning their world upside down for Jesus Christ. Wow, what a testimony. There was the results of the message. Now, let's take a look at the world's reaction to the message. The world, how it reacts to the message. Are you ready? Sounds like our day today, doesn't it? Sounds like even our churches today when they hear the gospel message at this church. Ah, but the Jews... The Jews believed not. They were moved with envy, and they took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and, 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 and they assaulted the house of Jason. This was Paul who led to Christ, a strong believer there, on his first missionary journey, and sought to bring them out to the people. The world was action was what? The religionist crowd rejected Christ. That's what happens today. Many of the religionists uh, today reject the gospel, and they reject Christ. Then when he talks about lewd fellows of a baser sort, I had to look that up. So what's he talking about? It was interesting. He's talking about those that are uh, loafers, idle, are you with me, and disorderly. This is who the Jews went and gathered up. They got the loafers, they got the idlers, you see, and they got the, uh, the disorderly, and they said, now you go out here and you get the city in an uproar. And that's what they, that's what they did. That's exactly what they were doing and trying to do, you see. And then notice uh, the reaction of the, uh, of the average citizen. Let's take a look. The react, this, and this is the action today of the average citizen. They simply ignore the gospel message. They reject the message. The average citizen doesn't want anything to do with it. And you know why? Because they're confused. You want to know why? Because they're, they're, they're mixed up. Because they hear preaching like this, and then they see all the other kind, and they go, what's going on? Something, there's, there's something wrong with this picture. How come this preacher over here and this preacher sitting out here and other good men like Dr. Bloom and, and, and Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Smith and, 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 and Dr. Mike over there. Uh, and the, how, how is it that the, the, these men, Dr. West, and how, how is it that these men are different than all these others? And after all, look at the success of all these others, man. They live they're, they're just they're multi-millions of dollars and, and they've got everything. And, and here's these little guys over here in the backside of nowhere uh, living out in a cow pasture. They can't even get a, you know, a, a hardly anything going and something's wrong. And so who's right and who's wrong? And where the average citizen goes today, they go to where the success, in their eyes, what they think is successful. But I want to tell you something. This little church here is pretty successful. I can guarantee you that right now. And the Lord knows my heart. I don't say that in bragging and blowing and tooting horns. But I don't know of another church in this county that has a ministry like we do right here at this church, that has an outreach like we have at this church, that are on seven, eight different television stations. You understand that? Two different radio stations, worldwide internet, worldwide YouTube, uh, iPhones, iPads, you name it, uh, 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 that, that's got a, an outreach of the gospel message that we pour our tithes and our offerings in to why, why we're not interested in building great big palaces here. We're not 
not interested in having a whole lot of stuff. We're interested in getting people saved for the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? I'm a messenger. I've got a message. And here's the message that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. He was buried. He rose again the third day over sin, hell, death, and the grave, and victory. And the fact that this Jesus that we preach to you today is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the King of glory. That's the message. So you see, there was the reaction of religionists. They didn't believe. There was the reaction of the loafers and the idlers and the disorderly. What they do? They had to go around and try to or, um, cause an uproar, uh, and then they went out and grabbed a hold of Jason. They were men with selfish motives, rumors being spread, talking against the elders. There in verse five. Now we come to verse six. Let's look at the charge against the message. Now, see, there's the world's reaction. Now let's look at the charge that they charged against the message. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. That's the charge against the the message. The message is revolutionary. The message of the gospel today is revolutionary. It will turn your life upside down. It'll change your life. It will turn you inside out, my friend. It'll make a new creature out of you, a new person out of you. And that's why we've got to get this revolutionary message out because it will revolutionize homes and families and lives if we just simply get the message out. That was their, one of their first reaction. These guys are turning the world upside down. Now, they didn't like that. You've got to remember that. They didn't like it. Because look at the insurrection they gave against them. Here was an insurrection. Now, look at verse 7. Whom Jason hath received. See, they claim Jason had received this message. He had received Christ. He was a believer. And these all do contrary. Watch this. Now, here we go. To the decrees of who, church? Caesar. Saying that there is What? Another king who? See, first they said this message that they're doing is revolutionary. It's changing lives and turning them upside down. Then they came back and said, as we grabbed a hold of Jason and brought him before the religious crowd and the leaders, he said, man, there's an insurrection with this message. They're claiming that there is another king named Jesus, and we are only loyal and committed to King Caesar. See, even though they were free to rule and govern themselves by Rome, they were still under Caesar. And the leadership had to be very careful. And they said, man, we cannot have these religious fanatics coming in here that are changing the world with this message because, and that the Jesus Christ is the king of the Jews. He's the Messiah. He's going to be the soon coming king and Lord and because that's going to mess us up with Rome. Caesar's going to get word of it and Caesar's going to come down here on us. That's what they were worried about. And see, that's what a lot of people are worried about today. That's what a lot of churches are worried about. They're worried about the government's going to come down on them. They're afraid the state's going to come down on them. The state's going to take away our tax exempt. But folks, our existence doesn't rely on the government. Our existence as a church doesn't rely on whether we pay taxes or we don't pay taxes. I'm not worried about it. If God wants his church to stay here and to go on and to march forward and go forward, if God has to, he'll raise up, a, uh, he'll send more rain and fill that pond up with and tell the preacher, now go out there into that pond and put out a pole and catch a fish. Now, Lord, you've got to be kidding me. You're asking me to do the most ridiculous thing in the world. That's grass out there. It just rained and it's flooded, and you're going to tell me there's fish in that pond. I'm telling you, go put it out there and put a hook in there and and catch you a fish, and in that fish's mouth is going to be a gold coin enough to pay your taxes. Hallelujah. Because God did it before. He can do it again. Glory to God. But oh, we got to be careful. Caesar's watching us. We better not speak out against homosexuality and gay lifestyles and gay marriage because Caesar's watching us. We better not speak out about abortion, 73 million babies killed because Caesar's watching us. We better not speak out about drunkenness and alcohol and all the vices and then drugs and all that it's doing because Caesar's watching us. And it's amazing how all these laws have been passed by just a handful of people. Just a small band. Where is God's people? Where is the church not crying out, marching down the street if we have to, and demanding this is not going to take place and happen? A 
Because you know why? We're messengers. And we got a message. And it's going to change people's lives. That'll hear it, receive it, and as these people, many believed. But you notice there were some who didn't. And they got mad. Why don't you believe and get glad? Oh, there goes that poet again. I'm telling you. David, you're writing all this down? He's got my dictionary. Now you've got to put a section in there of poetry. Lighten up a little bit. Smile, laugh, okay? It's okay to laugh at the preacher. He don't mind. I don't care. Oh, if we can be a fool for Christ, hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see, what were they claiming? These guys were bringing false accusations. Well, no, they really they weren't. They were just getting the people all roused. And says, These guys are claiming that there's another king other than Caesar. This guy named Jesus. He was a king. And he is a king. And he's coming back as a king. And then this whole world's really going to see. All those big loud mouth preachers, some of them, were right after all. But it may be too late. You need to make a decision today as in Sunday school. Where, what direction are you going in? You're at Kadesh Barnier. You're at the crossroads. You've got to make a choice. Or are you going to spend another 38 years wandering in the wilderness? You may not have 38 years. There were 300 people killed in Haiti. God bless them and their families and their homes. And, and I pray that many of them, I trust and hope that many of them were saved and knew the Lord. But if not, it's too late. It's too late. What are you going to do today? Well, look at here. Jason claims this guy is the king. Verse 8. Two more verses and we're done. All right, let's look at the last one. So the charge against the message was what? It was revolutionary and it was insurrection. And this man Jason made a claim that Jesus was another king. Notice, okay? And he is. Amen? Now let's look at verse 8. Now here's where the world comes in. Let's see how the world reacts. The world's fear of the message. What's the world's fear of the message? And they troubled the people. All right, that's all the people. And the rulers of the city, which most of the rulers of the cities were, were uh, uh, the, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, and then there were politicians as well, the leaders of the city, got them all shook up. And when they heard these things, now, here we go. When all the people, all the religious leaders, all the political leaders of the Thessalonica of that day, when they heard these things, when they heard this message, when they heard that Jews got saved, when they heard that God-fearing Greeks got saved, when they heard that some of the most important women in Thessalonica got saved, when they heard that this man Jason claims that there's another king and his name is Jesus, look what they did. Look at this. And when they and it says when they heard these things, and when they had taken security of Jason and of the others, they let them go. The world's fears of the world's fear of the message is they fear these men and these leaders are like many of them today that hold office and position. They were afraid they were going to lose their material possessions and their positions, and that's the way the that's the way the politicians act today. Oh, man, if we vote with you Christians, and go, we're going to lose our position. We're going to lose our, our, our pension. We're going to lose our health and wealth insurance we got. We're going to lose our $100,000 a year salary. We're gonna, and, and then we get to get, keep that too when we retire. They get 100% of their salary. Not a partial. Like many of you that maybe have worked and you got a little bit of a pension. You got 20%, 30%, 40% of it if you're lucky. Some of you may have got a little insurance to go along with it to help you out. Praise God. Hallelujah. But some of you got nothing. You know what this preacher got when he retired? Sitting right out here in the audience? Nothing. You know what this preacher's going to get when he retires? Nothing. But these leaders, religious leaders, you see, no wonder all these groups we got out there today are scared to death. And they don't want to preach the gospel and they don't want to take a stand against sin and all this stuff because they're afraid they're going to lose their millions. And I mean literally millions. They're afraid they're going to lose their power, their position, their influence. 
their wealth, their control. Oh, man, they feared the loss of material possessions and, 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 their, and, their, and their material possessions and their positions. No different today. Men reject Christ because of what it will cost them. You see, here's the proof. The, I said, today, men reject Christ just like this crowd did because they're afraid they're going to lose everything they have. They're afraid that it's going to cost them something. You see, to become a believer in Jesus Christ, now listen to me as we close this out, and to become a disciple, it costs you something. You see, there are believers today, but they're not all disciples. Don't let that alarm you. To be a disciple, it costs. It costs to be a disciple. It doesn't cost you anything to be a believer. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. All you have to do is confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. You shall be saved. Nicodemus struggled with that when Jesus told him three times, you must be born again. And Nicodemus didn't get it. What do you mean be born again? I've never heard anything like this. You must be born by the Spirit of God from above. Well, I don't understand what you're talking about. So Jesus, you notice that at that point in those first verses, 3 through 7 of Matthew chapter 3 there, when Jesus dealt with Nicodemus, or John there, and you notice he didn't, uh, John chapter 3, you notice he didn't tell him how to be born again? He just said, you must be born again. So the conversation went on. And then Jesus gets over to verse 15 and 16, and he says, here's how you get born again. For God so loved the world that whosoever believeth. And he went on from verse 15 through 18, and he told Nicodemus how to be born again. You see, man gets born again by faith. Man gets born again by putting his faith and trust and believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he becomes a Christian. He becomes a believer, but you don't become a disciple until you give it all up. Look at the verses. I'm going to share them with you here. Men will reject Christ today because of what it will cost them. And here's the first thing. Christ demands the denial of this world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world and the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world and Jesus demands denial of the world goes on and not only does he deny the denial of the world but he denies the, uh, us to deny death to all selfish desires and ambitions we've got to die to all of our selfish ambitions and desires if we truly want to be a disciple listen to what Jesus said in Luke 9 here verses 23 and 24 and he said to them all if any man will come after me, well, here it is, let him, what, deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. Jesus went on in Luke chapter 14 and verse 26. If any man come to me, and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my, what? Disciple. He didn't say a believer, disciple. Verse 14 and 33. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Are you with me, church? Getting quiet now. Romans 8, 13. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if through the Spirit do mortify, that word mortify means put to death, the deeds of the body, ye shall live. And the reason why most today do not want to accept Christ because they know it's going to cost them something. It doesn't cost you anything to become a believer in Christ except to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and by faith put your faith and trust in Him. But when we get down to talking about discipleship, 
one who's going to follow Christ, one who's going to uh, do his work and his service and, and, and the things that he bids and commands and, and, and that type of thing. we got to get to a place where we deny ourselves, be willing to give up everything we have, sacrifice it all if necessary to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And many today just simply do not want to do that because it's costly. But you know what I have found most of the time? That those men and women who really do sell out and dedicate their hearts, mind, body, and soul to the Lord and forsake all and all that we just talked about, God gives it to them anyway. And he gives it back double, double portion. And it comes back with blessings rather than sorrow. It's amazing. Solomon, what do you want? You name it and it's yours. Can you imagine God telling you that? And Solomon says, there's but one thing I want. I want wisdom on how to lead and guide your people Israel. And God gave him wisdom, and he became the wisest man that ever walked the planet other than Jesus Christ. But he also became the most wealthiest man. But the problem, you see, that got him in trouble. His song and wine and dance and women got him in trouble. His palaces and his gold and all of his jets and his chariots and everything got him in trouble. Do you know the Lord Jesus today? Have you been saved and born again? Become a believer? Have you committed yourself to being a disciple of Jesus Christ? It costs you something. The reason why men don't want to come to Christ today and reject the message as we saw in this passage. They got the message from the messenger. They even saw people get saved. Jews got saved. Can you imagine that? They accepted the Messiah. Devout Greeks got saved. The Greeks were very intellectual. So Paul reached even the intellectual. He reached the Jews who were zealot of religion and very religious. And then he reached in very important women. And it revolutionized Thessalonica. And they didn't like it. Oh my, we're trying to revolutionize our community and our state. And I'm afraid so many of them don't like it. Because it may cost you something. How can you consider it costing you anything when you seriously take a look at what it cost Jesus? It cost him everything. He left the portals of glory where he ruled and reigned uh, with his Father in heaven. Matter of fact, he was God in heaven. And he said, I've got to do something. My creation's falling apart. They're going to hell. And the only way they're going to get saved is I'm going to have to become a man. I'm going to have to clothe myself in humanity and take on flesh and walk amongst them. And 33, later, 33 years later, I'm going to have to go to a cross and die for their sin and take on their sin, who I never knew no sin. Look what it cost Jesus. Should we be do any less or be willing to do any less for the cost? I don't think so. Where are you at in Canish Barnea today? Which way will you go? Which way are you going to go? Got a choice to make. Joshua said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Moses said, by the way, all you Israelites, choose you this day whom you will serve. All you that are on the Lord's side, get on this side of the line. All the rest of you want to stay on that side of the line, stay on that side of the line. And guess what happened? There was a great earthquake, and the earth had about 30,000 of them for lunch. Are you saved? Do you know the Lord? I've run out of time. We love you. God loves you. Jesus loves you, and he wants to save you. If you're willing to put your faith and trust in him and believe that truly he is, the Christ, the Messiah. Believe that he died, was buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
that if thou shalt believe in thine heart that God had raised him from the dead, confess with thy mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Now it's not the prayer that saves you. You understand that. Prayer is words communicating with God. You get saved by putting your faith, your trust, and belief in the Lord Jesus Christ and His finished work, what He did on the cross of Calvary. And you're willing to do that today. See, folks, there has to be a willingness on your part. A willingness. And you're willing to do that today. You can become a believer. Which way are you going? You have a choice to make. I trust and believe and trust that you'll make the right choice. Will you pray with us? Dear God, that's right. Go ahead. I confess with my mouth, you are the Lord. Those of you here in the auditorium can say it with us. I confess that I'm a sinner. And I ask you to forgive me and to cleanse me. He will, my friend, he will. I do now believe in my heart that Jesus died on the cross just for me. He took my place. He paid my sin debt. I believe now that he was buried and he rose again the third day because I heard that today. And right now by faith, I do call upon you, Lord Jesus, and receive you into my heart and life to be my Lord and my Savior and to take me to heaven someday when I die. And I pray this prayer in Jesus' name, amen and amen.